So we need to talk about constitutional reform since 2010. Now, why this date? Because this is when the new Labour government finishes from 1997 to 2010, and we move into the coalition governments of David Cameron and Nick Clegg, and then the government of David Cameron, and then the government of Theresa May, and now the government of Boris Johnson. So we definitely have a division of parties. Think of it as the Labour reforms before 2010, and then the Conservative and coalition reforms since 2010. You could, in theory, get an exam question that asks you to look at um, uh, reforms before 2010 or after 2010, because it, and even since 2015 as well, because they are specifically named on the examination and specification. So you do need to know what the reforms are, both before 2010 and after, and where they go, in case you get a question that asks you to look at particular ones. So, um, as always, after this video, you need to do some further reading. You've got the textbook uh, references ab above me above me here, um, and there's various other web links that you can look at. Um, come go and speak to your teacher um, for further things. And, of course, the news, because constitutional reform is going on um, around us as we speak. So which reforms are we going to be looking at um, in this video? I'm just going to give you the brief overview, and then we're going to go through one by one and fill out lots of extra detail and improve your understanding and evaluation of them. Because you need to know what these reforms are, and you also need to know to what reform, uh, to what extent they have been seen to be successful. Because, because mo nearly all exam questions, well, all exam questions really, will ask you to debate them, to discuss them in some way, which will normally be to, to what extent were they successful in, in some way. So we have the Fixed Term Parliaments Act. Cameron comes to power uh, with Clegg and they, they change the way that prime ministers call elections. Um, it's been controversial recently and we'll discuss that. We've got the extension to devolution, Scotland and Wales. Not so well than Ireland, but they've been given a lot more powers over the last um, seven years, which we'll be discussing. Devolution has been extended not just to Scotland and, and Wales, but it's also been extended to individual cities such as Manchester, and that's the Manchester Mayor there, um, Andy Burnham. So individual cities have been given more powers. There's a new um, way for you to get rid of your local MP, known as the, uh, the Recall of MPs Act, and it has actually happened. There have now been two MPs that have been removed by their own constituents, not at a general um, election. EVEL, which stands for... I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what EVEL stands for when we get there, but maybe you can work it out um, before we get there. And lastly, the mother of all constitutional reforms, Brexit, if it happens. I'm writing this, I'm, I'm recording this in September, if you're watching this after October the 31st, did it happen? Anyway, let's go through one by one and talk about uh, what they are and why they're there and whether they've been successful. So. Calling a general election, believe it or not, has always actually been a power of the Prime Minister. And I've given an example here of Margaret Thatcher. And Prime Ministers have used this power to benefit themselves. Now, if you look at the general election dates uh, from throughout history, maybe kind of start at the 19 kind of 60s onwards, what you'll notice is that when a Prime Minister is popular, when they think they're going to win, they call a general election slightly sooner because this is their powers. And so you often get gaps of four years. So Margaret Thatcher comes to power in 79. She's relatively popular after the Falklands War. So she calls another one in 1983. That's a gap of four years. She does it because she's popular. She gets to 1987, gap of four years. She's popular. She calls another general election because she has the power to do so. Then she gets chucked out. John Major comes in. Uh, he's very unpopular. This time the next general election comes in 1992, which is fine, because he's unpopular. He doesn't think he's going to win, so he extends out that parliament for as long as possible. But he does win. He didn't think he was going to, but he does. Then he gets really unpopular. We have Black Wednesday, uh, John Major's government starts tearing it itself apart, and so he waits and he waits and he waits and he waits and he waits until 1997. That's a gap of five years, and he loses. He, he gets... He gets he gets chucked out. Tony Blair's government comes in. They're, then they go from 1997 to 2001, a gap of four years. Tony Blair is really popular. He wins. We then go to 2005, a gap of four years. Tony Blair is popular, so he wants to call the election sooner. Then we get 2015, which is actually a gap of four years. So that breaks my idea. No, wait. Hang on. I've lost myself. 
2001 to 2005. Sorry, 2005, he wins again. Then from 2005 to 2010, we have a gap of five years because Gordon Brown thinks he's going to lose and he bottles calling a general election, gets himself a new nickname, Bottle of Brown, and then um, he, wait, he, he waits um, and then he loses. So my point is this. It used to be the power of the Prime Minister, a royal prerogative, a power given by the King or Queen to the Prime Minister, and Prime Ministers have used that power to their advantage. That's not really very democratic, is it? That's a bit of a problem. So when the coalition government comes in in 2010, maybe for reasons of self-preservation, but maybe for reasons of democracy, they put in this thing called the Fixed Term Parliaments Act that says the Prime Minister no longer has the power to call a general election whenever they want. It has to be every five years, which is why you had a, a, a parliament from 2010 to 2015. And the idea was that from then on, it would be at regular gaps of five years and you'd know exactly when they were going to be. Think the American system. The American system, presidential elections, is always four years. The House of Representatives is always two years. There's no question about it. There's no question of calling an additional election in at, at various points because it's fixed. So this is kind of making us more, more codified, you know, in, in a way, giving us kind of a, 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 spe a specific system of when these elections are supposed to happen and how they should happen. Brilliant. End of the story. Yeah. Well, first of all, maybe they didn't call it for democratic reasons. Maybe because they were a coalition government, they knew that their government was going to be a bit more vulnerable. You know, if they started arguing with each other, if there was a split in ideas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so maybe it wasn't quite as as called for reasons quite as pure as they say. Maybe it was about preserving this fragile party alliance. And then it really starts to go wrong in 2017 because Theresa May is two years in. This parliament. So 2015, we now get to 2017. She sees an opportunity. She thinks Jeremy Corbyn is extremely unpopular. So she says, hey, I'm going to call a general election. But she can't because of the Fixed Term Parliament Act. But there's a thing in the Fixed Term Parliament Act that says if you get two thirds of MPs to vote for a general election, then you can still have one. So she goes to parliament and says, hey, guys, do you want a general election? All of the Conservative MPs vote for it because they think they're going to win. All of the Labour MPs vote for it because they don't want to be seen to vote against a general election. And to be honest, they think they're going to win. And so what's the point of the act? Why is it there um, when the MPs will vote for it? So, so your teachers and, and political scientists were then saying, well, what's the point of this fixed term Parliament Act? Because MPs will always vote for a general election. Until last week, when Boris Johnson says, hey, I want to have a general election. So he goes to Parliament and says, I want to have a general election. And this time, Parliament says, no. He doesn't get two thirds of MPs saying he wants a general election because Labour, most Labour MPs vote um, against it. And in fact, they do this twice. So the Fixed Term Parliament Act has prevented a Prime Minister from calling a general election. So has it been successful? Or not. It's certainly been controversial. It's taken the power away from some prime ministers, and because Boris would have called one if it hadn't have been for this act. Um, if you want to get really messy with the with the art with the uh, the numbers just for a second. I, I kind of like this one, so I'm going to explain it. Technically, you could get rid of the Fixed Term Parliament Act with a simple majority in Parliament because all laws in Britain are not entrenched. So you could get rid of the whole Fixed Term Parliament Act with a simple majority in Parliament. But in theory, within the Fixed Term Parliaments Act, it takes two thirds of MPs to call for a general election. So, to call a general election, Boris Johnson needs two thirds of MPs. But to get rid of the act that requires him to have two thirds of MPs only requires 50% of MPs. Think about that one. Right, extended devolution. Devolution is when powers are given by the national government lent to the national from the national government to the regional assemblies we've got the the welsh assembly we've got the northern ireland assembly we've got the scottish parliament now in the, in the uk unlike the us devolution is unbalanced scotland has more powers than wales and northern ireland and there are historical reasons for this uh, there are also issues of kind of uh, how popular devolution was and, and things like that. But Scotland has always had more powers, which is one of the reasons why the Scottish one is called a parliament and the other ones are called assemblies. But this has been tried to re be, be rebalanced in recent years. So the Wales Act in 2014 gave, if I check my book here, gave the Welsh uh, 
um, a, uh, devolution more, more powers, the powers of uh, cont to control taxes and control more of the revenue from them. Um, it also meant that they could uh, hold their own referendums on various things. Then, if you remember, there was an independence referendum in Scotland. Now, David Cameron called this referendum thinking, ha, of course, Scotland will never leave. But then the polls started getting very, very close and David Cameron thought, oh my goodness, I might lose a referendum. But of course, that would never happen. And um, they come up with this idea, which is called The Vow, which is, which is the newspaper I've got here. It was quite famous. They got all three main party leaders together, which was David Cameron, Nick Clegg, and Ed Miliband at the time. By the way, if I'm talking too fast, pause the video, take notes, digest, watch it again, etc. Um, he says, they, they go to basically go to Scotland through this newspaper and they say, if you stay in the United Kingdom, we will extend devolution even further. We will give you more powers uh, to um, increase your welfare provision. We'll give you social security benefits. We'll give you power to set different rates of income tax um, and do things with VAT. Um, it also means that, it also made devolution permanent. You know, the idea that the, that the national parliament couldn't, um, take, them, take them away, although Parliament is still sovereign, so that's a bit kind of more complex. But it, it, it was a promise to the Scottish people. Scotland voted to stay in the UK, and therefore the Scotland Act 2016 um, increased the powers further of the Scottish Parliament. Think Nicola Sturgeon's Parliament and Ruth Davidson, you know, the, 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 their Parliament is more powerful than it was. Wales Act 2017 increases the power of Wales even further. Um, they can now rename themselves a Parliament if they wish, um, as well as powers over public services. Now, Northern Ireland, question mark, question mark. I just want to put a little note here because the Northern Irish Assembly is not currently sitting as of September 2019. Um, they are a special case whereby they, they, they do something called power sharing. We're going to talk about this more in, in a future video in terms of devolution. But the Northern Irish Assembly has not had the same power extensions in the same way um, as the other two because it's not currently sitting Talk about it further but if you're talking about whether this whether devolution has been a further success you could argue it has been a success because it has they have increasingly been given more powers you could also say that devolution has prevented scottish independence because of the vow or you could argue it the other way you could say that demands for scottish independence have increased because they now have their own parliament their own, their own identity you could also argue that devolution has not been a success because the Northern Ireland Parliament is not currently sitting and it hasn't had its powers extended, so it's only working in, in certain areas. Um, when we get to the devolution chapter, we'll discuss these ideas. So this was one of George Osborne's big ideas. George Osborne was Chancellor under David Cameron, and they wanted to take this idea of regional devolution and apply it not just to the, the big four of Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, but also apply it to the big cities. Now, London got its own mayor back in 1998, 1999, somewhere around there. Ken Livingstone, New Labour created it. And then since then, you've had Ken Livingstone, you've had Boris Johnson, and now uh, Sadiq Khan have been London mayor. Pretty famous figures. But why not other cities as well? So they created mayors in other cities like uh, Manchester, Birmingham, um, I think Liverpool's on the way as well, um, there's a few others around the place, <clears throat> and they've created these new elected mayors. Now these cities have often had mayors but not elected and they also increase the powers for them. So this is Andy Mayor, who Andy Burnham, who is now the mayor of Manchester, and he is uh, has been given various powers, he's been given a budget, he's been given um, various controls, and they're looking at extending the powers even further of these elected mayors, and I'll be discussing that. I'll, I'll be discussing that further. Um, now, police commissioners has the, the mayor thing seems to have been relatively successful, but there's been another one which has not been successful. They tried to create, or they have created, elected police commissioners. Now, these are local representatives who are in charge of making sure that your police do a good job. They're given a budget. They can hold the police to account. They can. They can. It's about making your your local law enforcement more accountable to you. That you get to elect this chief, this police commissioner who is in in charge of the police in your area. They're given a budget, uh, which you pay for in your local council taxes, and they are supposed to be pretty important. However, 
I bet you haven't even heard of them. I bet you couldn't name your local police commissioner. And that goes for almost everyone else as well. They, um, the turnout for these elections has been minute. They've been, I think they came down to about 12% in certain areas and they're not, they rarely go above 15%. I think one got up to 30% and they said that was a huge success. I mean, just think about that. 30% was a huge success. Um, they haven't, what I'm, whilst I'm sure the people that are doing them are good people and they're working hard, it really hasn't taken off as like a thing that people know their local police commissioners and have um, kind of em embraced them. It's worth you kind of Googling, have a little look, because um, I bet you didn't know where they were, so it's worth you just doing five minutes research to find out what kind of things they do, but also this idea of very, very, very low turnout. If you haven't come across the word turnout before, it's the amount of people that vote in an election, um, that, out of who could vote. So, so in general elections, you tend to get around kind of 60, 70% turnout because some people never vote because they're, you know, they're maybe they're ill or they, they can't get there. But you know, turnout is the amount of people who, who choose to vote. Business rates, health budgets. So the, the last part of city devolution is they are now starting to experiment with giving cities more power to spend the taxes raised by business rates. And in Manchester, they are now experimenting with letting Manchester choose what it does with its own health budget. The idea is to give more independence, to give more autonomy um, to these particular areas. It's starting to feel a little bit federal, which is a word that you've probably come across in when we talked about the constitution, but it's starting to feel like you've got these more and more independence in these local areas in more and more areas. These are a bit experimental. See how they go as you're taking the course, see if they appear in the news. Um, but it looks like there is being an increased um, wish from Westminster to push more and more powers out into independent cities, which is similar in a way to what they used to do with schools when they created academies. They, they have this idea that they want to create competition independence to stimulate growth, to stimulate um, efficiency savings to, to, to kind of not just dictate what you should do, but more to give you a budget and then say, go do it. Recall of MPs. So you have a general election, you've got an MP. So you want to get rid of that MP. What can you do? Nothing until the next general election, which is, as I've mentioned earlier, probably going to be four or five years away, depending on what's currently going on with the Fixed Term Parliaments Act. Now, what if your MP does something dodgy? Well, technically, there's still no way to get rid of them. There are certain rules about if they, if they, if they go to jail and, and, and things like that, they're removed. But what if you just really dislike what they're doing? Can you get rid of your elected representative? The answer used to be no, but from 2015, the answer is yes. And the way it works is this. You have to go out and you have to get a petition and you have to get, I think it's 10% of everyone that lives in that area to vote to say, we want to recall our MP. That then... Excuse me, that then triggers a, a by-election. And a by-election is like a general election, but only in that local area. Um, and it's happened, um, I believe, three times. There we go. Yeah, I was, looking at, I was looking at this earlier to make sure I had my facts correct. So it happened um, in 2018. It happened to Ian Paisley Jr., who is Ian Paisley, the famous Ian Paisley's um, so he was suspended from the House of Commons for, for, for breaking the law on his expenses and they didn't manage to get the 10%. So they got this, they got 9% of people in the local area to, to, to sign it, uh, which wasn't enough to, to trigger a, um, a by-election. And a year ago, I was, I was a little bit scathing about this. I was like, well, they've made, they've made this recall of MPs Act um, and it's never happened. And the only time it's actually happened, it failed anyway. So it, it, it's a pointless reform. However, then thank you very much to MPs. Some truly, some two far more dodgy MPs came along and now we have two examples of it being successful. So we have uh, Fiona, who was a, uh, she was a Labour MP and she got convicted of various traffic offences and the recall petition happened. It got 27% of people, which triggered the by-election and she went, but Labour held the seat. Happened again. 2019 to a, a, an MP called Christopher Davies. He provided uh, misleading expenses claims. Uh, there was a, a recall petition, got 18%. This triggered a by-election. And not only did it trigger a by-election, but he lost his seat and another party took it. Uh, and the Lib Dems took it, which actually then helped to reduce Boris Johnson's, or Theresa May's at that time might have been, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure which MP it was, which Prime Minister it was, but it reduced their majority even further. So it was not only a big deal for that individual MP, it changed the representation in that local area and it actually changed the, the makeup of Parliament 
um, even further. So big deal, recall of MPs, holding MPs to account, because every MP now knows if they do something illegal um, or if they perhaps really upset their constituents in some way, there is a risk that they could be uh, removed. Democracy in action. Pretty much, I'd have to say, you'd have to say this one would be um, in the successful category, especially now it's actually happened. Evel stands for English Votes for English Laws. Now, Scotland has its own parliament, which means in there there's a low group of Scottish uh, MSPs that only vote on Scottish issues. And then you've got um, uh, Wales, where you've got a group of uh, Welsh Assembly members uh, that only vote on Welsh issues. Where's the English Parliament? There isn't one. I mean, the Westminster Parliament is in um, England, but in the Westminster Parliament, you've got Scottish MPs and you've got Welsh MPs and you've got um, Northern Irish MPs, and they all sit in the same place, which means, and this is the problem, Scottish MPs vote on English issues, but the English MPs don't have any influence in the Scottish Parliaments. So there is a, an imbalance there. So they've created this thing called EVEL, English Votes for English Laws, that basically says, it's a complicated process, but in short, it basically means if you're a Scottish MP, then your vote on issues that only affect England doesn't count. Um, the process is a bit more complicated than that with various majorities, and the picture I've got here kind of explains the process. You can Google it further if you want. But basically it means, if you want to write about your exams easily, it means that only English MPs can vote on English issues in the House of Commons. Now, this is brand new, really, only came up, I think, a couple of years ago, and it's still kind of seeing, well, how well does this work? Basically, the Speaker has to choose, is this one of these bills that only affects England? So the Speaker gets a bit of power here, you know, is this an English vote? Um, and if it is, then the other procedures kind of go in, go in place. Um, in some ways, it creates two tiers of MPs. It creates those who are English in Westminster and those who are not. So uh, in a way, an English MP has suddenly become a bit more powerful than a Scottish MP because the Scottish MP can only vote on, say, let's say, 90% of issues, but an English MP can vote on 100% of issues. Has this caused any major issues? Have you seen it all over the news? No, we haven't. Um, and it may be just a minor constitutional tweak, but technically it has changed the way laws are made um, within Parliament. So it's a constitutional change. Worth one that's having a look at when you get closer to your exam just to kind of see, well, you know, has this had an impact? Is it still popular? What's going on? And lastly, Brexit. This is a huge constitutional change. Like that, that you can't understate this or, 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 or even, oh, no, you can't even overstate this. This is massive in terms of British constitutional change because the whole essence of being in the EU is we say, okay, we're going to pool our sovereignty, key phrase, pool the sovereignty. We are going to obey the laws of the European Union by choice. We are going to go there. And there's been a lot of them that have come up over the last 30 years in our membership of the EU. And um, so that means there's now a huge amount of laws that we in Britain follow that after we get to October the 31st, we're not going to follow. Now, it started with a referendum, as I'm sure you're aware, 2016. We had the referendum, leave one. Article 50 has been triggered. That means the process of leaving the EU officially began when Theresa May did that. And she invented something called the Great Repeal Bill. And so the idea was, well, what are we going to do with all these laws? We've got this huge amount of European laws and we've got British laws. And when we leave the European Union, suddenly all these European laws are going to just disappear. I mean, that's just going to cause chaos. So the Great Repeal Bill is the idea that you take all the European laws, a whole lot, and you take them and you put them into English law. That's a big constitutional change because you're taking all of these laws that were just coming from the EU, EU directives, and then you put them into uh, UK law. So, so you're making them statute, using that phrase there. Um, and the idea is that once you put them all in, you can then pick them off one by one. You can remove them one at a time if you like them or if you don't like them or uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it isn't yet clear what's going to happen with when we leave the EU. The whole, are we going to have a deal? Are we going to have no deal thing? Depending on whether we do or whether we don't have a deal will affect Britain constitutionally because it will change whether we actually 
uh, follow certain rules, follow instructions, to what extent do we follow the European Court of Human Rights, to what extent do we obey the European Court. Um, watch the Brexit story because the outcome of whether we get a deal or no deal affects Britain's constitutional makeup, to what extent our country is run or not run or follows or doesn't follow various European directives or institutions and things like that. And lastly, thank you Mr Boris, the backstop, the Northern Irish backstop. There's a problem with Northern Ireland. It's physically attached to Ireland. The rest of the UK is separate. I think there's sea all the way around the edge. And this Northern Ireland backstop is an issue because it's basically what do you do if someone drives a truck containing goods from Northern Ireland and drives into Ireland or drives from Ireland into Northern Ireland? It's to do with customs, the customs unit, it's to do with trade, it's to do with, well, what happens if um, people try to import goods effectively illegally once we leave the EU by driving across that land border. Now, we'll go into this in more detail in a future video or you can read it yourself. But the question is, is will this eventually lead to Northern Ireland being treated differently to the rest of the UK? The DUP definitely don't want this, but others are more open to the idea. Because at the moment, in theory, no matter where you are in England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, the law is the same, the rules are the same, the jurisdiction is the same, you're all in the EU, you're all not in the EU. But the this backstop issue, the Northern Ireland issue, could, could lead to a situation where constitutionally Northern Ireland is treated differently to the rest of the UK. Has Brexit been a successful constitutional reform? That one is up to you. But we'll have to see where it goes over the next few years. Final thing I'd like to talk about in this video. Do you remember this slide from one of the previous videos about the definition of entrenched? Now, UK laws are not entrenched legally. There's nothing that says that we have a law which is higher than another law, the two-tier legal system. There's nothing that says here's your constitutional law and here's your other statute law. It doesn't exist. But we have started using referendums a lot more. There was a referendum on the Scottish Parliament, referendums on Scottish independence, referendums on Brexit, referendums on... Um, there must have been others that I've momentarily forgotten, but they, they have, there have been referendums. And there's become this kind of convention that if you want to have a big change, then you have a referendum. Maybe not the minor tweak ones like evil, but if you want to have a new mayor, then you have a referendum to say um, that we want to have a mayor. Now, does having a referendum effectively entrench the decision? So if all the MPs tomorrow said, we don't want to have Brexit, so we're not going to do it, could they do that? Legally, yes, because Parliament is sovereign. Politically, maybe that decision has been entrenched by having that referendum. Maybe the Scottish Parliament, which in theory could be removed, is actually effectively entrenched. So the point I want to leave you with here is, or to think about, is does a referendum result effectively entrench a constitutional change? Is it impossible to amend that change without perhaps holding another referendum. So could you stop Brexit by having another referendum? That might be a way of doing it because you could unentrench it using the method you use to entrench it. Or in fact, could a referendum result just be ignored? Believe it or not, there have been referendum results that have been ignored in the past. Um, might be something that's worth you kind of exploring. Um, but just something for you to kind of think about. So you could make a paragraph, a very good paragraph in an essay that says, Britain doesn't entrench its laws, it has no two-tier legal system. However, it does effectively entrench some constitutional changes through referendums and then kind of explore the ideas that I have there. Hope you find that interesting. Hope that you learned lots. Um, and um, I'll see you on the next video or in class.